This is Chief. I'm recovering from a cold, so if my voice sounds really nasal and deep, it's because of the cold. I've had a cold, really bad one for like the last several days. Last week I left off that I was going to talk about recruiters. Uh, the lead into that story is, is that back when I went to basic training, we were like 750,000 strong, the largest the Army has ever been at peacetime. And of course, we've been downsizing ever since that time. So we actually had a XO of the company, which I think, believe, was a first lieutenant. So while a couple weeks into the basic training, the lieutenant sat us all down, and he just basically said, I want to hear the lies that your recruiters told you. Because you got to realize, this is mid-'80s when I joined the military, and this is right after the Judy Benjamin Army, or the Private Benjamin by Goldie Hawn, where she got told by the recruiter that she'd be living on a vista near a lake or near the ocean and have her own private yacht and everything else. I mean, he sold her a whole king caboodle. The movie is okay because the first half basically deals with her joining the military, being in the military, and the second half is basically her being married to the Frenchman that she meets and it, no, not even related to the military hardly at all. So, like I said, so a few guys, I don't remember what they actually said, but a few guys got up and told a couple stories about, yeah, the recruiter promised them this and promised them that. Nothing really major. So this relates to my first encounter with the recruiter, and this is back at 18 years old. I went down, did sign the thing for the selective service, and then got a lovely postcard about nine, ten months later. And my brother was already out of the military by then, and he was back from, his, like I said, his tour of duty. And he said, don't go down there. I said, well, I said, he invited me. I'm not the kind of guy that, you know, shrubs the stuff off like that. I just wanted to hear what this guy had to say. He said, well, don't sign anything. I said, yes, brother, I'm not going to sign anything. I'm just going to go hear what this guy's got to talk about. So I get down there, and this is Inglewood, Colorado, and all the recruiters are in this big, long building, which is wide enough for an office and a hallway. Kind of like an old, I think it was part of an old school building. I can't remember exactly. So the Army recruiter was like the third one down, so I had to pass by. I know at least the, the Marine Corps for one before I got to the Army recruiter. So I get in there, and what do I see? I see a snake oil salesman. I kid you not, this guy looked like a greasy dirt ball. I mean, he was immaculate in his uniform. He was nice in his presentation, but this guy was a snake oil salesman. So he sat me down and he started talking to me. And he's like, well, what are your interests? I said, well, I'm going to college right now. I'm living at home, working part-time job. And he's like, uh-huh, 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 taking us down and acting like he's really concerned about what the heck I'm saying. So then he gets into his spiel. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, I gotta take a drink. He said, I'll tell you what, I can guarantee you, you interested in the military police? I go, no, not really. But he says, hey, it's a good job. It's a good career field. I'm like, okay. He says, uh, I can get you a military police job. And you say your folks still live here in Colorado or Inglewood. I said, yes. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll even guarantee you that you'll be uh, at Fort Carson, down the road, down in Colorado Springs. That way you can come home every weekend. That's where he lost me, telling me that as an MP in the United States military that I'd have every weekend off to come home to visit mom and pop. Oh my God, I couldn't believe he actually tried to promise that. And then he's like, well, yeah, you said you're interested in college. Well, I'll tell you what, Army gives you ample time to, to keep, continue your education. You'll have lots of time to go you know, continue your education, complete it, get whatever degree you think you might need or want, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I'll tell you what, we can start this all right now. And he says, I can get this all in a written contract. And I said, what can you give me in a written contract? He says, I can guarantee you that you'll become an MP at Fort Carson with weekends off. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, weekends off and continue college. I stood up. I looked at him and I basically said something to this effect. What kind of drugs do you think I'm on that you can promise me all that kind of stuff? And he, he's like, what do you mean drugs? And I said, 
You must think I'm high that you can guarantee me those four things. And he said, well, yeah, we put it in the contract. I said, you can't promise me anything except I can get in the military, get an MOS of my choosing or our choosing, and who knows where I'll be assigned with weekends off. Yeah, weekends off in the Army. Mm -hmm. Any military service doesn't have weekends off. I'm sorry to tell you that. That job is 24-7 if, if need be. So I stepped out of his office. This guy followed me out into the hallway and he started screaming and pointing, kind of like our Lee Army in full metal jacket. We're going to get you. We're going to get you drafted. And we're going to get you to Vietnam, young man. You cannot walk away from a deal like this. As he started screaming, the Marine Corps recruiter stepped out of his office, did one of those like parades, half parade rests put his arms behind his back and kind of looked up and down the hallway. I looked at the Marine recorder and I says, I don't know what kind of drugs he's on today. And the Marine recorder just gave me a, like a stern look and I walked out of there. So those were the lies that my recruiter promised me when I was 18, possibly just before I turned 19. Now, no, I did not get drafted because uh, 1972 was a year that Nixon decided to pull out of Vietnam and he did away with the greater share of the draft. I probably would have been drafted that year because if I memory recalls, my birthday was 125 and my last letter of my name was five, if I remember correctly. So I probably would have been drafted if Nixon had not pulled out of the war. And this will come to reflect because at my first AIT, a lot of the instructors were my age and they asked me, you're our age, why is it you're not already in the military. And then I looked at them and I said, did you guys get drafted or did you volunteer? And they kind of hummed and hawed around and you know gave that look and most of them said, well, I wasn't really doing anything with my life. I wasn't going to college, so yeah, I volunteered. So I, I said, that's the difference. So like I said, we had a lieutenant and we had several talks because the lieutenant was the one that was also responsible for given us all the uh, classes on like the Red Cross, uh, AER, um, all the programs that the armed military could offer. Uh, so therefore the uh, commander, the captain didn't have to do that. I don't know how I'm going to continue doing these uh, basic training things, but I'm just going to talk about probably uh, stories that happen. And the next story is about one of my fellow recruits. I uh, used to watch football. I was watching football semi-faithfully until I kind of went to basic training. My nose is itching again. I don't know why. And uh, But mid-season, this player came into Reno, so to speak. We had a recruit by the last name of Perry. Perry was a very big person of black heritage. One day, our one of our uh, drill sergeants came in, and I do believe it was Drill Sergeant Johnson, who was also black. My nose is itching, I don't know why. And he said, Perry! He says, have you been watching football? And of course we haven't. We're in basic training. He says, do you know that there's a guy called Refrigerator Perry? And all of us were like looking at each other because no, we haven't been watching football. We've been in basic training and Perry, like I said, Perry hadn't come to Reno until like about mid-season. So Drill Sergeant Johnson sat there and looked at Perry and says, from now on your nickname's going to be Refrigerator, just like Perry. So we're all scratching our heads and of course we all had to wait until we got out of basic training to find out who this Refrigerator Perry was. Now, it seems like... KP hit me at infrequent times. So the second time I had to do KP, we uh, had marched out to the field with all of our battle gear to include our shelter half. I was issued a shelter half, so I had to set up a tent with my bunk mate to complete a tent, so therefore we had a full tent for us to sleep under. Got my tent all set up, got my campsite all set up, and all of a sudden they started rattling off names. About 12 of us, I do believe it was. 
You guys got KP. It's already oh dark thirty almost. Well, that's during the morning. I'm sorry. So it was late in the evening. Like I said, I went to basic training in, in October, November. So it was already dark. So that means by the time we got in there, the uh, chow hall would have been closed for dinner. So therefore, we had to do the dinner dishes, and then we had to sleep the night in the barracks and do the uh, breakfast dishes and then return to our company sometime mid-morning, I think it was. So the 12 of us, they rattled off one of the uh, drill sergeants to come home with us because we had to sleep in the barracks that night. They had to find somebody to open up the arms room because we had to turn our weapons in because we couldn't sleep with our weapons in our room. Drill sergeant says, okay, I don't care which rooms you sleep in, you're sleeping in this room tonight. And this is after we'd already done KP, so we're all being led back to the barracks after doing KP for the evening. And uh, <laughs> I don't care where you're sleeping. He says, you're all gonna sleep in this room tonight. So he threw 12 people in an eight man room. Yeah. So he says, I don't wanna hear a peep out of you. Good night. He no more than left. Guess who was on KP with me? Refrigerator Perry. <laughs> He had a smile on his face. He says, guess what guys? He zips down his field jacket. He pulls out a box of uh, raspberry cream of donuts. He had put a box <laughs> of donuts in his chest. That's how big he was. Got it all the way back to the barracks. Drill sergeant never caught on because he didn't make us, you know, whip our coats off at first. He just threw us in a room and gave us instructions and left. So Perry's sitting there, pulls out this box of donuts, and they're all powdery and everything. We didn't care if we made a mess because by the time we would have ate him, the drill sergeant would have found out who, who would have came at him. But it was just so hilarious because everybody was like, oh man, I should have done that. But like I said, Perry was about the only guy that could pull it off because it was a big box. I mean, it was about the size of a pizza box because it was just a flat box filled with donuts. It wasn't like the uh, ones where they stack side by side by side. So I, I think I'll end today on that story, but it was like one of the funniest things because we, we ate donuts. <laughs> we had a good time that night. We talked a little bit. It was just like uh, being out in the middle of the field and we're all like, hey, we're not sleeping out on our tents in our sleeping bags. So a couple guys went to another room, actually pulled their bunk beds apart just to bring the mattress in so we had enough mattresses because, like I said, he threw 12 soldiers in an eight-man room and expected us to buddy up or whatever. I don't know what he was expecting. So that is it. I'll keep on, like I said, I'll keep on doing stories like this throughout basic training because there's really no set schedule because I don't remember what we did from week to week. So this is Chief signing off. See you next week.